now, please let me hand over to the chair of the second panel, which is the Human Rights Panel. Uh, the chair is Professor Surpapa Petronasiri from Mahidol University in Thailand. And I see you sitting there. So can I please hand the reins over to you, Professor? Um, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Sarah. I wonder if everybody hear me. Okay, uh, good. Um, uh, thanks for um, actually, you know, managing the time. We have uh, four minutes uh, behind schedule, but I think we are fine. Uh, I would like to first um, introduce myself. My name is Sipapa. I'm from the Institute of Human Rights and Peace Studies. Mahidon University in Thailand. Uh, thanks, organizer, for organizing uh, this particular forum, a very timely, you know, conference on COVID-19. Um, I also would like to thank uh, uh, participants and, of course, you know, the authors who will be speaking. Uh, in this particular panel, which is about um, uh, uh, emergency law, human rights uh, in the time of COVID-19. Uh, there are altogether in this particular panel seven papers. Uh, one of the paper was written in Vietnamese, uh, thanks for the abstract in English, so I can understand. Um, I, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, maybe, you know, to pick up the points uh, the way that Sarah has done. Uh, of different papers uh, before I uh, start asking questions. Uh, there, 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 there is one or two questions uh, to the speaker for, of this panel already. Uh, as I said, there are seven papers. Some of them actually are overlap with uh, some papers of the first panel, uh, which is about the uh, emergency law. And I think that is quite natural. Uh, there are five papers which address particularly uh, emergency law uh, in Vietnam and other countries. One paper, which is the first paper, is about, uh, uh, the title is The Protection of Human Rights in Emergency Situation by uh, uh, Nguyen Dinh Thuan. Um, I'm not going, I'm sorry, I'm not going to uh, introduce each of you in detail because I think you got your profile uh, in the documents uh, in the link already. Uh, this paper is quite distinctive from uh, the rest, uh, at least from the five papers, six papers, in the sense that the paper focus on the issues of discrimination and stigmatization to gain yeah, uh, those infected and uh, suspect of infection COVID-19. Uh, so uh, uh, the paper reveals discrimination in different countries, including Vietnam, of course, uh, uh, in particular. Um, actually, uh, it talks about violations of human rights associated with labeling uh, to uh, labeling and stigmatization. Uh, and uh, the paper identified the needs uh, for anti-discrimination law uh, to protect the rights of the people during the, especially during emergency time. Uh, the second paper, uh, uh, which is about well, assurance of human rights in an emergency under the legal regulations of Vietnam, so the focus is on Vietnam, uh, prepared by Fu Hong Ang and uh, Pham Jing Li. Uh, I found it you know, quite interesting in the sense that the paper outlined the legal regulations uh, which actually provide you know, the executive uh, to declare state of emergency and restriction of rights, of course, especially the ordinance on emergency of 2000. Um, uh, it also uh, explain the rights recognized by the 2013 uh, constitution. The paper uh, makes specific comments on shortcomings, uh, recommendations uh, to address them, uh, the paper actually emphasized, and I would like to, uh, to, to mention this, emphasized the need to replace the ordinance on emergency law of 2000 by another law which uh, should be complied with the provisions of 2013 constitution. Uh, 
so that uh, and also uh, you know some specific regulations to limit the executive power uh, the third paper uh, the Chinese laws on protection uh, human rights in state of emergency experience for Vietnam by Nguyen uh, Minh Tham. Uh, if, uh, in, uh, again, another interesting paper uh, that the paper uh, recognized that, you know, in the situation uh, in which actually it talks about the survival of the nation uh, is under threat, uh, some rights could be derogated. Uh, but then uh, the other uh, emphasized the fact that there are some you know, similarities, similarities in the case of China and uh, Vietnam. Uh, 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 similar problems you know, in, the, in more or less the same situation. Uh, if, uh, uh, there is no monitoring mechanism to monitor the exercise oh, of yeah. state power. Uh, and uh, the other recommends uh, to clearly distinguish between the state of emergency and martial law. Uh, the fourth paper, which is about digital, digital rights in the state of emergency in Vietnam during COVID uh, pandemic, uh, by Pham Hai Chung and uh, uh, Mo Chi Minh Hương. Uh, the paper of uh, actually uh, the main question is about uh, to which to what extent freedom of expression can be limited, you know, uh, in the state of emergency. Uh, uh, it discussed the rise to uh, different freedoms. Uh, uh, the paper focused, as I said, on the practice of digital rights in Vietnam and the spread of fake news and disinformation. And the paper uh, reiterate at the end the importance of the right to information and digital rights of the peoples in time of COVID-19. Uh, uh, so um, uh, that's the fourth paper. The fifth paper, which is about authorities and application of restrictions on human rights as the result of emergency measures. Uh, by Nguyen Chi Minh Ha and uh, Tha Duk Khua. Uh, the paper actually not only explained about authorities, which enact the emergency law in Vietnam, but also uh, those bodies equipped with, you know, equipped with power to declare uh, emergency law and measures. And the papers raised concern over the fact that emergency ordinance issued in 2000 is no longer comply with the uh, constitution to 2013 and that the authoritative bodies uh, as provided by the law are no longer active. Uh, so uh, the paper actually conclude by pointing the need for a supervising body to oversee the proper application of restrictive, restrictive measures under emergency law. Uh, the, uh, uh, sixth, the sixth paper in the principle of proportionality in limiting human rights and its application in the case of emergency, I think the first panel, the issue of proportionality was um, also uh, discussed. So uh, it explained, you know, the principle of uh, uh, proportionality. Uh, if, uh, it's uh, uh, elaborate uh, the four basic elements. Uh, it also, actually the paper finally concludes that the, any restrictions of uh, rights should be an exceptional measure and must be proportionate uh, to the severity of the, city, the situation. And uh, uh, it also recommends for an independent protection and monitoring mechanism uh, to be put in place to ensure the rights of the people. And uh, the last paper, which is uh, quite distinctive uh, from and the first six papers, it's about state emergency and the enjoyment of human rights in the time of pandemic in ASEAN uh, by the Yu Yun uh, uh, Yuning Gram, who is uh, currently the Indonesian representative to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. Uh, so the papers assess a practice of imposing state of emergency in Cambodia, the Philippines, and uh, Thailand. Uh, it looks at the implications of the state of emergency law. Uh, uh, the papers also describe, you know, some rights which are uh, being violated, and the paper actually questioned the necessity, proportionality, as well as the 
procedural requirements, which is the, the notification to uh, treaty body. Uh, and it, uh, of course, you know, the paper proposed uh, further investigation to the issues. So these are, these are the summary of uh, seven papers uh, presented uh, in the in the in the second panel. I like to I like to check if all authors are, are now attending uh, the conference and ready to answer to the questions. I guess you are all here, and I guess for the paper with two orders, you have already identified who will be answering the question. Uh, I, I start with my own question to uh, the orders first. Uh, we got, as I mentioned, uh, some questions uh, to, for, on some papers already. So the first question that I would like to ask is to Nguyen Ding Chuan, uh, the first paper. On discrimination. Uh, my my question is actually, if uh, John, if you think that discrimination is uh, more serious in terms of emergency uh, COVID-19, or it is just a confirmation of existing discrimination in Vietnamese society, and uh, if the anti-discrimination law that you uh, recommended will really contribute to address this social issue. I hand over to you. Great. Thank you, Fritz Zafa. Uh, Hello, everybody. I think that is uh, difficult to assert that uh, discrimination uh, does not exist in Vietnamese society. Of course, it is so tough to state that discrimination was only serious when the COVID-19 epidemic occurred. Mm. The story of my family is an example. My young brother has been studying in China. He came back home in December 2019 when the COVID epidemic happened in Vietnam, April 2020. It means that after five months when my young brother came back home, my neighbors didn't dare to communicate face to face with him. Even some people did not dare to enter my house to visit my parents. Some reported it to the police and local authorities to force my young brother to go into isolation. isolation. Um, I think it's, a, and of course, it's a, that's a discrimination. After the epidemic until now, they are very happy to talk to my young brother normally as nothing had happened. Uh, discrimination no longer exists in my family. Uh, this proves that COVID-19 brought discrimination to people, but discrimination did not exist before. In another aspect, it is clear that discrimination still exists in Vietnam, such as gender discrimination, ethnic discrimination. Currently, the Vietnamese constitution has provision, provisions on anti-discrimination. However, anti-discrimination is a lack of legal framework. Uh, the enforcement and sanction of anti-discrimination provision are limited. Once they are full legal framework, sanctions are applied, and at the same time, from the uh, perspective of law enforcement, focusing on prevention, prevention measure, raising awareness of the community, following that discrimination will be faded and disappeared. In other words, the law on anti-discrimination will contribute uh, to uh, the effective resolution of this uh, social issue. Um, thank you, thank you, Joanne. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you, yeah. have, you have finished your three minutes. 
I yeah, yeah. forgot Thank to you. mention that yeah, each speaker will be having three minutes ah, to okay. respond. Uh, the next question is on the second paper. Uh, thank you. I uh, for for the second paper, I um, my question is uh, actually about uh, what aspect of bribes uh, that uh, the others the two other things are not subject to any restrictions in time of pandemic, and who actually benefit most from economic and monetary measures that the government introduced to assist those affected by COVID-19? Because I think your concern is about uh, the fact that executive uh, power is actually exercising their authority to uh, come up with economic monetary measures to assist the people. So please, who, who yeah. is going to address the question? Uh, Hu yeah. Hong Ang or uh, Pham Ching Li? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you for your uh, comments and questions. For your question, I would like to uh, give you my answer as follows. The scope of limitation on human rights depends on the severity of the pandemic. During the second outbreak of COVID-19, from the April 1st to uh, 22, the government, uh, Vietnamese government implemented a number of measures of social distance. Uh, they restricted uh, uh, restrict, uh, human rights in own fields from economic, cultural, social, civil, and political uh, rights. Uh, the people uh, benefit most from economic and uh, monetary measure of government improves as the employee working under the labor contract um, must postpone the performance of the labor contract take leave with their pay for one month or more due to the businesses uh, have have been uh, dif difficulty by covid 19 pandemic individual business uh, whole home which touch revenue of under five thousand dollars per year. Poor and nearly poor uh, whole home people with meritorious services, social protection uh, benefits selling. Enterprise most uh, directly affected by uh, COVID 19, such as enterprises in the field of agriculture, forestry, fishery, tourism, and businesses in the field of construction production. Uh, that is my answer. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. I think we'll be, if we have time, we'll be having some follow-up uh, questions uh, to, uh, to the paper. Uh, I move next to the third paper, uh, which is about Chinese and Vietnamese emergency law. And uh, my question is uh, uh, whether or not the author could elaborate uh, what measures applied by China and Vietnam during the COVID-19 uh, that you think are not comply with international standard and what are the impacts on the rise of citizens in the two countries. Uh, you outlined some of them in the paper already. Please, these are some uh, uh, very uh, easy questions for you to elaborate in three minutes, please. Thank you, Dr. Sirana. Uh, my answer is, in the case of Vietnam, we have an audit in the state of emergency in 2000. But during the COVID-19, the government did not declare the state of emergency. Instead, the Prime Minister used some directive documents to prevent the spreading of the easy, which includes restrictive measures that the citizens right, such as uh, implementing social isolation, limiting freedom of movement or right to privacy, etc. In my opinion, these documents are executive documents rather than legal documents, and the following measures are not compatible with the Constitution of Vietnam and ICCTR as well, because they are not prescribed by the laws but by executive documents. 
in the case of China through social media, we know that in order to control the spreading of the COVID-19, various restrictive measures on human rights were taken by the Chinese government. But I think I need a further survey because Chinese law on the state of emergency and the China case are quite complex, in which the regulations of the state of emergency are scattered in the constitution and various other laws. In both countries, I think the most impact on the right of citizens is that we don't have an effective mechanism to review sub following laws and ask of the state that related to limitations of the right. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan, for your very concise uh, answer uh, to, to the question since I uh, said to the previous uh, uh, author that we may have. Uh, further questions later. Uh, I'm moving on the fourth paper, which is about digital rights. And my uh, question to uh, Pham Hai Chung and uh, Huang is actually what is the general situation of the rise of information and digital rights in Vietnam? Of course, I learned that from time to time bloggers were arrested you know, and uh, imprisoned. Uh, that would be you know, my understanding. And actually, how the, this change in time of COVID-19 uh, uh, and what are the concrete impacts on the rights information of the general public? Uh, I saw that you prepare PowerPoint. Uh, I think you can finish within three minutes, please. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I just dropped some uh, answer of my questions here so you can see it and uh, must be in three minutes. So it's good for you to look at some stuff to answer the questions uh, related to our paper. So, um, to understand about the digital rights in Vietnam so far, uh, there's one law that uh, uh, attracts a lot of international attention about the, the new cyber security law in Vietnam in 2018, and it was effective from the 1st January 2019. So, in this case, with the law, the government also um, issued some of the other law uh, in, term, in the concerns of, uh, let's say, national securities or emergency state or um, uh, social order. Um, that's why uh, in the times of COVID, um, I mean under the uh, constitution laws of Vietnam, um, uh, people have the right to uh, freedom of expression, um, inform, uh, access to information. But in some cases, uh, the government also um, issue some regulations um, to make sure um, the um, uh, the national securities also to make to guarantee the social order. For example, if you look at in our paper, um, they also issue um, one degree number uh, 15, and it was effective on the 15 April in the high times of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So in this one, they also um, uh, give a stipulate advice of all the people that spread um, the fake news and hate speech on, 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 on social media. That I gave very detailed statistics in my paper. Um, and uh, but on the other way, um, uh, in the terms of uh, COVID-19, uh, um, we see that all the information from uh, the COVID-19 was quite very transparency. And there's um, a very good um, a change here, like uh, the Ministry of Healthcare, they even sent all the uh, masses, SMS, and information update about uh, the COVID to everyone um, how, um, on, on the system, on, so, uh, on the fan page of uh, on social media, website from the government, and is, uh, also SMS. Um, that's why um, that uh, research um, to see how um, Vietnamese people are aware of the COVID-19. Um, and the research say that majorities of the people answer, they say that they are highly aware of, and, uh, of the COVID-19. That's why uh, so far people so, um, I mean, like so confident uh, with the case of COVID-19 so far in Vietnam. Um, and I think um, it might a change after um, this case, um, maybe, um, I mean, uh, some certain law of Vietnam may be revised um, uh, with, uh, to, to make sure whenever we have a similar case or uh, emergency state happen. Uh, thank you very much, Chung. I just uh, want to uh, ask you a very uh, short question if in Vietnam there's currently uh, the law on fake news. Mm. Um, on fake news, uh, look at that, they have the, um, 
the degrees um, uh, uh, we call degree number 15. Uh, it was issued like on the uh, 2nd of March and was effective um, in 15 April. So based on this one, especially the Article 101 in this degree, um, it stipulates uh, a people from uh, 10 to 20 millions around, let's say, uh, four to some hundred US dollar if they spread the fake news. And if you look at in my paper, I also give the statistic of some hundred people got the fine mm -hmm. in, the, in the time of COVID-19 because they spread the fake news. And it, co it caused a lot of harm to the communities. At first, a lot of people share that stuff. And is there any yeah. is there yeah, any yeah. timeline specified in the uh, law on fake news there? Uh, yes, before we start to discuss fake news and hate speech, uh, let's say three years ago, when I worked for the Pro uh, Vietnam Program for Internet and Society, and one of the first um, conference we did uh, three years ago on hate speech, and start from that, people start, uh, the government start talking about fake news and give the code of conduct uh, on social media. But actually, the real uh, law work in this case, that's the degree, uh, was effective on 15 April. It worked. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I, I may like to, uh, there is a question from the chat box. Uh, actually, how the, the term fake yeah, is defined uh, uh, and decided. Uh, my uh, additional question to Sebastian uh, question is actually who is interpreting what is fake news and what is not fake news? You mean the questions for me or um, the previous uh, speaker? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, if, uh, yes. So that uh, uh, the question here is uh, yeah, if the term fake. Uh, new is defined and who is interpreting what is fake and what is not fake in Vietnam yes of course in Vietnam yeah so uh, fake news so far was defined like full information um, so in this case if people spread full information that cause a harm to the communities and make confusion among people and also track some certain kinds of uh, communities and social order or economic um, crisis so it called fake news what I, I read in the law yesterday the degree uh, yeah okay all right it's quite a, uh, a broad definition there uh, i guess we'll be coming back to this later thank you very much Chung. i yeah. move to the fifth uh, paper which is about authority and application of restrictions on uh, human rights uh, uh, in the uh, emergency time and my question uh, to uh, Thi Min Ha and uh, Tha Duk Hua is uh, that it seems that during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Vietnamese authorities continue to enforce laws uh, which the orders identify as no longer updated in the ordinance of 2000. Uh, therefore, uh, that particular ordinance uh, may and be not valid any longer. So I wonder if the two orders could you know, identify concretely what would be the proper supervising body at national and local levels, and if the idea of setting up an dependent national human rights institution is possible at all in Vietnam. Thank you very much for your comments and questions. I, I think that the first thing lawmakers should do in Vietnam in terms of authority in the state of emergency in Vietnam is to adopt a law or a state of emergency to replace the 2000 ordinance or a state of emergency. The provisions on authority and application matters to restrict uh, human rights shall be in line with the constitution. And the constitution is the law having highest legal value in the legal system. Therefore, other valid legal documents shall not be against the constitution. The 2000 ordinance on the state of emergency is still in force for 20 years up to now. There have been many legal changes, particularly with the adoption of the 2013 constitution, so that several basic provisions of the ordinance are no longer valid as, as, allowed, as, as follows. Under the 2013 Constitution, the authority to regulate state of emergency belongs to the National Assembly because the limitation of human rights and, and, and citizen rights shall be 
uh, regulated in the form of a law. The Standing Committee of the National Assembly has only the authority to declare a state of emergency. However, the 2000 Ordinance on the State of Emergencies was adopted by the uh, National Assembly Standing Committee. That's, uh, that is in, uh, in consistence with the 2013 Constitution. Therefore, the National Assembly should use its authority to enact a law on state of emergency to replace the 2000 ordinance. And uh, further, the provisions of the 2000 ordinance that the people's whole procuracies at all levels is in charge of law observance in the implementation of the resolutions or declarations of a state agency is no longer effective for many years. It is because the function to supervise the law, observance of ministries, uh, ministerial level agencies, government attached agencies, local authority and social economic organizations, uh, and so on, uh, as prescribed in the uh, 1992 uh, constitution was abolished in 2000. And one. Therefore, it's required to have a competent authority to perform this function in replacement of the people pro accuracy. In the event of uh, no agency in trust of uh, supervising the law in a state of emergency, it's likely that the provisions of, on authority and application of measures to restrict human rights shall not be properly implemented or violations. Uh, so, uh, therefore, mechanisms to control the law observance in a state of emergency play a very important role in uh, minimizing violations of authority as well application of measures to restrict human rights when the society is in a state of emergency. So, uh, so my, my question is that if an independent national human rights institution is possible in Vietnam, Uh, cái câu hỏi thêm cho chị Hà là vậy thì có cần thiết có một cái thiết chế uh, nhân quyền độc lập để, để để bảo vệ để các cái quyền con người trong tình trạng cấp hay không? Có cần có một cái thiết chế uh, nhân quyền độc lập hay không? <cười> <cười> yeah, he, she's thinking about your, your question and, and answer maybe later. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say? I didn't hear you. She's yeah, still thinking uh, about your question and, and answer you maybe later. Okay, all right. Yeah, please, uh, uh, please keep that question in mind. So I move to the next paper, which is about principle of proportionality. So my question to the um, author, uh, Do Kong here, uh, is actually, um, uh, uh, for the author to elaborate uh, further if the principle of proportionality has been applied in Vietnam, uh, uh, you know, uh, when restrictive measures are imposed, and if not, what measure you think excessively applied by the state during the COVID-19? Hi, Madam Chair and ladies and gentlemen, I will answer your question briefly. I mean, uh, during the COVID pandemic, Vietnam has applied many measures to restrict the expansion of the pandemic. In general, many international organizations and other countries consider the reaction of Vietnam is useful, very useful. But the excessive application, as you mentioned, of the set of emergency could be seen in local government. I mean, some government is some kind of province apply many improper measures, such as uh, the provincial government of Quang Ninh, Quang Ninh, a provincial a province in the north of Vietnam, restrict all the inhabitants to come in and come out the province, and the province government of Bắc Ninh, next to uh, Hanoi, restrict all persons from other provinces where still have COVID patients, even there are very few patients in their province. 
I think this measure is, is considered unnecessary because you know the sources, the source of coronavirus is from another country. Why Vietnam has closed the border before? So and in reality, the the measure of the province has stopped by the central government. I mean the the cabinet, the the government. Yeah, is my answer. Uh, thank you. So I I understand that the uh, uh, issues is more at local level than mm -hmm. uh, at national level. Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, move to the last uh, paper. Uh, Yuyun, uh, I guess you are on already. I saw you at the very beginning. Um, you know, uh, the Yuyun paper, you know, address the uh, imposition of emergency law in three countries. And I um, like to ask you a question, and you got more questions from the audience as well. That uh, I wonder, Yuyun, if uh, you could provide some insight if it is, um, if actually the emergency law apply in those two countries, in, the, in those three countries, really contribute to the better, at, to better address the COVID-19 situation when compared with the rest of ASEAN where emergency law has not been imposed and how Aisha is dealing with the imposition of, hum, of uh, emergency law and violations of human rights associated with it. Uh, you in the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank you very much, Chair, for the questions. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, for the questions, um, so these papers actually look at the practice as not yet the comparison, but thank you for the question. Um, so roughly uh, what, what we have been uh, seeing here uh, to compare uh, the three countries that impose a set of emergency and the rest who do not impose the set of emergency. In terms of the, um, the compromises in relation to the enjoyment of human rights, these two camps, both uh, the one that impose a set of emergency and not imposing emergency, uh, human rights situation is compromised. So uh, at this point, we can see uh, uh, there is no better whether uh, imposing or not imposing. And secondly, that the state of emergency give a bigger uh, role or disproportionate power to executive branch. But we also see one country, uh, I mentioned Malaysia, does not uh, impose state of emergency, but uh, a movement of control. But the government limit the uh, parliamentary meeting. So again, whether or not um, uh, state emergency imposed or not imposed uh, in these two camps, uh, we see similar uh, indication. And now we can see the statistic. So uh, on, on the countries that impose uh, state emergency like the Philippines, the infectious uh, cases and the death, the death continued to increase. On the other camp, like Indonesia, does not impose state emergency the number of uh, cases also increase and the death number is also increase. So perhaps it is not about set of emergency that is needed to address the COVID-19, but rather massive tests, stress and treatment that is needed now. Uh, uh, this is to answer your question, Chair. The second question in relation to the uh, IHA response on the imposition of the state of emergency, we have not yet discussed uh, further on uh, uh, this particular issue, but yes, we have discussed about uh, the need uh, that ASEAN member states to uh, focus on human rights uh, in dealing with uh, COVID-19 and also how we can move forward. Last meeting, our last meeting on the 30th, uh, 31st meeting of ICER just uh, this week, we discuss about how we can move forward with this uh, COVID-19 because it is going to stay for a long time. Uh, what we, what, but we have not been able to discuss further in substance. So that's uh, my question, my answers there. Thank you, uh, Yu Yun. Uh, you got answer from the chat box as well, and it's from uh, Min Chun Dang. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Dang is wondering if it is uh, the decision 
to impose emergency law itself that was unnecessary and disproportionate or it's about it's about some major specific measures that have not met you know the requirement of state of emergency as required by international laws that that that, that was the first question uh, the second question is actually uh, what is or what are supervising or review mechanism in the three countries and how you know if that exists or how it's function thank you thank you for the question in relation to the necessity i think the decision of imposing or not imposing state of emergency lies in the state but as you know the uh, general comments number 29 already provided a number of guidelines for instance the threat to the life of the nation if it is if the country feel that the covid-19 fulfill this kind of uh, this kind of uh, criteria that maybe a country can decide to to put, to choose for set of emergency secondly is the extent of the risk to the existent so this is debatable my my opinion this is debatable whether covid-19 really challenge the existing of the state or, or, or the nation it has a number of risk like uh, food uh, shortages and a uh, number of people died, so uh, the spread of the the, uh, uh, the disease, but not necessarily, I, I am not convinced that the COVID-19 will uh, diminish or, or, or uh, challenge to the existence of the, of the nation. But it is, again, up to the country uh, how they, uh, uh, how they uh, understand the, 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 the situation, because one country experienced different different uh, severity and the scope in relation to COVID-19. And the third uh, uh, criteria that Human Rights Committee put uh, forward is the whether the state emergency needed to address COVID-19 and whether other conventional measures are not sufficient. So this is the question for me because whether countries already uh, exercise all uh, measures because it seems to me, for instance, in uh, in the countries like Cambodia or Thailand, the the um, the state of emergency, the decision to impose the emergency come too early. I also notice in the case of uh, Philippines, they come uh, in the in number of steps: uh, proclamation uh, uh, nine to nine, and then go to the uh, uh, Republic Act one one four six nine. So. But again, this is debatable because to address COVID-19, uh, the, the key to address uh, COVID-19 is on the quick response. But, but what kind of response in the category of quick response itself is also debatable because like for instance, New Zealand very quick in response but not necessarily having a state of emergency. So, so that is why at this moment um, with this fire rough draft, uh i i see that number of countries too fast to take the uh state of emergency as one of the quick response that they consider thank you very much uh Yun, with your very clear answer uh, we got a few more questions uh and uh in the, uh maybe you know five minutes uh two questions to uh do kong here uh, which is about proportionality and the question is actually for uh, here to describe more specifically uh, about the legal definition uh, uh, of proportionality in Vietnam and uh, further question is if there is uh, any you know rules or provisions in any law uh, regulating about uh, proportionality. This is the question from the legal team. Uh, another question for here is um, for yes, for here. Who has authority to decide whether the area will be closed or not? Is it the local or central government? How is uh, uh, what is the mechanism or the process to close uh, such area? Uh, here, I hand over to you. Yes, thanks for your questions. Firstly, about the, the question of the legal team. Actually, Vietnam has not recognized the principle of proportionality, so we cannot find the, any kind of provision 
directly uh, mention the proportionality, but we can find a relating um, provision in the Vietnam Constitution in the Article 14. Uh, it says that uh, the human right could be limited in case of necessity. So I mean in proportionality test, yeah, there are two of uh, their four stages. So one of these stages is about the necessity. So this um, provision, I mean the Article 14, is very close to the principle of proportionality. Is is um, my answer for the first questions. Uh, the next questions about the authority to decide whether um, okay the closed closing. Uh, in case of COVID pandemic, uh, in one month, during one month, the central government grants the authority to local government to decide it. Yes, and after this period, they, I mean, the local, the local governments don't have this uh, authority. Yeah, this is my answer. Sorry, Madam Chair, I, I, I cannot hear you. Thank, thank you uh, for your always concise answer to the question. The last question uh, for this panel comes from uh, uh, Nguyen Ding Chuan, uh, addressing the paper on digital uh, rights uh, to uh, Chung and uh, Hua. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, uh, sorry, the question is, uh, about right to information uh, in the paper. The question is about right to information. Then uh, uh, the you know uh, the question is uh, uh, impacts of derogation of right to access to information and then freedom of expression in 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 time of state of emergency. Uh, Chung, you'll be answering the question of her. Uh, who who would answer it? Okay, who please hear. Yeah. Uh, um, in in our um, research and, and um, uh, uh, papers, we all also uh, review the situation where whether uh, uh, right to information and expression were limited or restrict, uh, restricted in case of emergency of COVID nineteen in Vietnam. But the fact that the uh, the impact if uh, these rights are limited or restricted is quite um, uh, it's not clear in, in the case of Vietnam because in fact Vietnam um, do not impose a such strong or strict restriction. Um, the digital rights were quite um, quite um, uh, guarantee in the way that social media and other internet is still um, effectively working to promote sharing of information. Uh, but the, the, the fact is that uh, whether the information is fake news or uh, not uh, as true to serve the public purpose of knowing the truth to uh, to put uh, to to put um, to to know about the situation uh, and immediate um, and update information. Um, there are many cases that um, and they, instead the government impose the um, encourage self regulation on individual why they share information to public um, and, and in, in some serious case they can make an administrative fine um, to this situation if they share the fake news so um, in a way it is um, um, to confirm that uh, to guarantee digital rights and uh, freedom of information and information uh, expression is important in case of emergency. But at the same time, it needs official uh, channel of information from the government uh, for the purpose of the truth to serve the public, to be awareness, to have a public awareness, as well as to uh, avoid um, the, the situation of fake news that may be harmful to people, even to suspects or victims of, uh, of, of COVID-19. Thank you, Huang. Uh, very last, last question uh, from uh, the audience uh, to Ha and uh, Hua, and I'm asking you to answer in 30 seconds. 
What is the first thing lawmakers should do in terms of authority in the state of emergency in Vietnam? Yes, as uh, as uh, I uh, as she uh, she answered your question, uh, that uh, one of the first things that the lawmakers should do is to adopt a law on the state of emergency and uh, to replace the 2000 ordinance. And secondly, your previous questions about uh, if Vietnam uh, need to uh, have an independent human rights uh, protection commission. Uh, see things that is not uh, necessary in this uh, at this time uh, because it's uh, it's not um, uh, it's challenging to have a such uh, independent uh, human rights commission and also one of the for her is uh, now is uh, the, the the most important purpose of the law is to uh, to, to 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 for the social order the social security is the most important thing not for human rights uh, in, in, in the city of of Vietnam. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we have to close this particular panel. We have uh, finished our uh, about 15 minutes already. I'd like to thank uh, again all participants and all uh, other speakers uh, for this particular session. Uh, it was uh, very informative and i like to thank you to be very cooperative in keeping our time. Uh, thank you very much indeed.